Allah revealed to the Prophet Iqra, the first verse that he revealed to him in order to teach us that we are the ones who need to constantly be learning, seeking knowledge and the greatest knowledge that you can learn it is the ilm of Deenullah Azza wa the religion of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala So I urge every single one of us insha'Allah Ta'ala to write notes down if you don't have a book and pen then write it on your phone make notes because the way we are going to be teaching the seerah, it is not that I'm only going to be narrating incidents or stories to you. But I'm going to tell you after every incident, everything that we mention, what benefits we can take from these matters that we can implement in our lives practically. That is the objective. Seerah to Nabi alayhi salatu salam. The seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The ulama, they say that the seerah, it is the life of the Prophet ﷺ from his birth to his death. Everything that occurred. That is the seerah. Right? And a seerah linguistically, it means a path, a way. That's what it means linguistic in the Arabic language. And learning the seerah, it has benefits. I'm going to mention a number of benefits that we are going to benefit from learning the seerah. Number one, by learning the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, we learn how to truly follow the Prophet ﷺ. We learn how to truly follow and imitate the Prophet ﷺ because the Prophet ﷺ was sent to us to follow him, to follow his example. And without following his example, we shall not be successful. Allah Azza wa says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Certainly, the Prophet ﷺ is the best example for those who seek Allah and the last day and remember Allah often. And Allah Azza wa He says, "Qul in kuntum tuhibun Allah, fatbi'uni yuhibbukum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum." وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ قُلْ أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Say to them, O Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, If you truly love Allah, then follow me, Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, and Allah will love you, and forgive your sins. And Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. Then Allah says, Allah, say, obey Allah and the Messenger alayhi salatu salam. The obedience of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, it's obligatory. How can we obey the Prophet alayhi salatu salam if we do not know him? Now, also from the benefits of learning the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, it increases your love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. How can you love someone if you don't know them? The more you know the Prophet sallallahu the more you love him. And also, you learn about the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu the companions, who were those who followed the Prophet sallallahu in everything, and they showed us how to imitate the Prophet sallallahu alaihi They taught us that through their actions. You learn that by also learning the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu Also, you learn from the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu We also benefit that. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he went through every stage of life that we went through. When he was a child, when he sallallahu alayhi wasallam was a young man, when he was a da'i according to Allah wa ta'ala, in his jihad, in his sabr, his patience, in his victories against his enemies, all of that, you learn how the Prophet alayhi salatu salam was in all those situations. And we also learn how the Prophet alayhi salatu was as a husband, as a parent, as a son, as a leader, as a judge, as a worshipper of Allah wa ta'ala. All of these are different aspects of the life of the Prophet ﷺ that we learn through the seerah. So you learn how to be the best in that by learning how the Prophet ﷺ was regarding those matters. The seerah, every single part of the society benefits from the seerah. The da'iyah, the one who's calling to Allah ta'ala, he learns how to give da'wah through the seerah, through learning how the Prophet 
call to Allah. He learns what to prioritize through the seerah in his da'wah. He learns what is the correct methodology of da'wah and how to be wise in your da'wah by learning from the Prophet ﷺ's seerah. Also, you learn from the seerah how to deal with difficulties and adversities and hardships that come your way. Because the Prophet ﷺ faced a lot of that. How did he deal with it? What did he do? ﷺ? You learn it through the seerah. Also, the ulama, the scholars of Islam, it is essential for them to look into the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because by learning the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, we truly understand the Quran. It's a practical demonstration of the Quran, the seerah. How to practically live by the Book of Allah. Because Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm al Mu'mineen, she was asked, How was the character of the Prophet? And then she said, radiallahu anha, Kana khuluqu al Quran, his character was the Quran. The Prophet embodied the Quran. So if you want to learn how to live by the Quran, you need to learn the seerah of the Prophet. You also learn the tafsir of the Quran through the seerah. And you learn the asbab and nuzul, why verses were revealed. Because through the seerah, we're going to come across verses that were revealed in different incidents. What was the cause for it and so on. You also learn through the seerah, the correct character and ethics and morals. Right? Because the Prophet ﷺ had the best character. So through the seerah, you learn that as well. These are all different matters that you learn through the seerah. The salaf, rahimahumallah, the seerah was very important to them. It is reported that Imam Zuhri, rahimahullah tabarak wa ta'ala, he would say that fi ilm al-maghazi, ilm al-akhirati wa dunya He would say in the knowledge of the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam and the incidents that occurred in the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam is the knowledge of the akhirah and the dunya. The knowledge of the akhirah and the dunya is in the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And also, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, the sahabi radiyallahu anhu, he would teach his children the seer of the Prophet ﷺ. And his children would say, right, Ismail, his grandson, Ismail ibn Muhammad ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu, he would say that, Kana abi yu'allimuna maghazi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya'udduha alayna wa yuqulu hadha ma'athiru abaikum fala tudayyuuha. He said that our father used to teach us the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, step by step, stage by stage. And he would say that this is the legacy of your far forefathers. Do not abandon it. Some of them salaf would say that our parents would teach us the seerah like they teach us a surah of the Qur'an. That's the importance of the seerah in the life of the believer. Right? So we need to constantly teach ourselves and learn the seerah. You learn your correct aqeedah from the seerah. You learn how to worship Allah through the seerah. You learn how to behave as a Muslim through the seerah. You learn how to rectify mistakes through the seerah of the Prophet You learn how to deal with people through the seerah. You learn how to be a true leader through the seerah. You also learn how to influence others through the seerah. All of these are different matters that the seerah of the Prophet teaches us. So it's essential that we learn the seerah of the Prophet we are going to start, inshallah, the objective in this class. Uh, our classes on the seerah, the way it's going to be structured, it is as follows. We are going to cover the Meccan period in this class. And I'm very optimistic, inshallah, ta'ala, that inshallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, we're going to complete the Meccan period in the next four weeks, inshallah, including this week. That's the objective. So these classes are going to be a bit intense. But I want you to be patient with me, inshallah. I need four days of intense classes. You have to be patient a little bit and you attain khair out of it, inshallah ta'ala. Right? So are you going to be patient? Yes. Khalas. But we start from the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, specifically from when his father, Abdullah, he got married to the mother of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, Aminah. Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. He got married to Amina bint Wahab. Right? The Prophet ﷺ's father, when he got married to Amina, after they got married, he traveled 
to Yathrib and pass Yathrib into Asham, Syria. When he went to Syria, he went for business. On his way back, he stopped in Yathrib in Medina, what is known as Medina today. And when he stopped in Yathrib, he was with some of his relatives and he became very ill there and he ended up dying there. His wife, Amina, was pregnant at the time. She was two months pregnant with the Prophet ﷺ when his father died. It is as if Allah or it, it is as if the Qadr was saying to Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib that your duty here is done. Muhammad alayhi salatu salam is on his way. Your duty in this world is done. You may leave. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he is born in Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. What happened that year? Huh? What happened the year of the elephant? Why is it called the year of the elephant? Huh? Um, what was the name of that leader who tried to destroy the Kaaba? On this side. Abraha. Abraha, where was he from? But where did he reside? Which country? Al Yemen. Right? Why did he want to destroy the Kaaba? What was the reason? Yes. He built a church. He wanted to and he, do something similar for the Christians that the Arabs have in terms of the Kaaba. So he built a huge church. And one of the Arabs, he defecated in that church and covered it with feces. So what did Abraha do? Abraha wanted to get revenge on the Arabs and he wanted to destroy the house of the Arabs, yani, of their place of worship, the Kaaba. And Allah narrated to us what happened in Surah Al-Fil, where Allah destroyed them and protected his house. The Prophet ﷺ was born in that year in Rabi' al-Awwal, the month of Rabi' al-Awwal. Which day was the Prophet ﷺ born? Monday. Which date of the month? The 12th? We don't know which day the Prophet ﷺ was born. Right? We have narrations that say the Prophet ﷺ was born the 6th of Rabi' al-Awwal. We have some that say he was born the 8th. We have some that say he was born the 12th. And that's a lot of them, the scholars. But there's no... Clear cut narration that says the Prophet ﷺ was born on this specific date. What does that show us? That the birth of the date of the Prophet ﷺ's birth, it had no significance in Islam. The Sahaba didn't even know it. They didn't know what exact date it was. Because it didn't mean anything to them. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ being born is a great deal for the Muslims. It's a great deal for the universe. But there was no significance attached to that day in terms of doing something special. There was no celebrations that were done. Because the Sahaba didn't know which day it was. They knew he was born on a Monday. But which Monday in the Rabi' al-Awwal, they didn't know. Right. طيب. The Prophet ﷺ was born in Rabi' al-Awwal. And he was named Muhammad by who? By his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. He named him Muhammad. What does Muhammad mean? The praised one. The one who's praised. That is the name that he gave him. What is the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ? The Prophet ﷺ lineage is important that we know it. He is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Write it down. I want you guys to try to memorize the lineage. Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ibn Abdul Muttalib. Ibn Hashim. Ibn Abdi Manaf. Ibn Abdi Manaf. Ibn Qusay. Ibn Kilab. Ibn Murrah. Ibn Murrah. Ibn Ka'ab. Ibn Lu'ay Ibn Ghalib Ibn Fihr Ibn Malik Ibn Nadir Ibn Nadir Ibn Kinana 
ابن خزيمة ابن مدركة ابن إلياس ابن مضر ابن نزار ابن نزار ابن معد ابن معد ابن عدنان up to here the lineage of the prophet عليه الصلاه والسلام agreed upon there's no differing up to adnan is agreed upon between adnan and ismail عليه السلام is differed upon right so adnan is from the offsprings of ismail that's agreed upon there's no differing there but the forefathers that are in between Adnan and Ismail, that's differed upon, upon the, um, amongst the historians. And that's why Al-Baghawi, rahimahullah, azza wa he says that we have nothing authentic reported from the lineage of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, above Adnan, between Adnan and Ismail, alayhi salam. And Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, azza wa he says that this part of the lineage that we have mentioned so far, it is ma'loom, it is well known, bisihha, authentically. Right? And there's no khilaf at all, no differing at all. But he says the khilaf is between Adnan and Ismail. And that's why Ibn Sa'ad, he mentions that the methodology of the scholars, it is that between Adnan and Ismail, they don't mention any fathers. They don't mention any fathers. They are some of the historians that mention some of the fathers, right? But because that's not authentic, they don't mention it. After Adnan, they say, Ibn Adnan, min walad Ismail, from the offspring of Ismail, Ibn Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Right? Now, طيب. that is the, the nasab, the lineage of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam. The lineage of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, it is the most honorable lineage. Right? And this is important, by the way. The lineage of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, is extremely important because the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi salam, being from an honorable lineage, Right? It makes him from a certain status. It makes him from a certain status amongst his people and his community and so on. Which makes it more likely for people to accept him as a leader. Right? Whether it is a prophet or a king or whatever it may be. Right? And until this day, this matters. Even the, the time that we live in now, a person being from an honorable lineage, it matters when it comes to him being in a position of high status and so on. Right? Now, طيب. So the Prophet ﷺ was born. And when he was born, his mother, she saw a dream prior to his birth. She, she saw a dream that a light came out of her that lit up the palaces in Asham in Syria. She saw that dream before the Prophet ﷺ was born. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would say that he, I am the dua of my father Ibrahim and the glad tidings of my brother Isa alayhi salam. And I am the one that my mother saw the dream that the palaces of Sham were lit up with lights. A light came out of her, with the light that came out of her. Right? What is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam that the Prophet alayhi salam is referring to? It's in the Quran. Anyone know the ayah? Ah. Naam, Rabbana wubaath fihim rasulan. Oh Allah, he said, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Wubaath fihim, sent to them, amongst them, Rasul a messenger, who is going to recite to them your speech, right? And teach them it, and purify them. That was the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that messenger is the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. He's referring to Mecca, right? What is the glad tidings of Isa, of Isa alayhi salam? Uh, we have that in the Quran as well, right? What is it? What did Allah say? That Isa alayhi salam said? Uh, and he gave glad tidings of a Rasul, a messenger who's going to come after me. And his name is Ahmad, which is one of the forms of Muhammad. It comes from the same asl, which is Hamd, praise. Right? Which is one of the names of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, after he was born, the norm, the custom of the Arabs, it is that 
the Arabs, they will send their children to the countryside to be looked after. And they'll be breastfed there. So the Prophet ﷺ, prior to leaving his mother, he was nursed by Umm Ayman. Umm Ayman was the slave of his father. Her name was Baraka. And she was from Abyssinia. Umm Ayman, she used to nurse the Prophet ﷺ. And the first person who breastfed the Prophet ﷺ was Thuwaybah, who was the slave of Abu Lahab. She was a slave woman of Abu Lahab. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Arda'atni wa Aba Salama Thuwaybah. Thuwaybah, she breastfed me and Abu Salama. Thuwaybah also breastfed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, who's the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. So Hamza is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and he's also his brother from Rida'a, from breastfeeding. Right? And so is Abu Salama. He's the brother of the Prophet ﷺ from breastfeeding. What does it mean that he's your brother from breastfeeding? He has the same ahkam as your actual brother. And your sister will have the same rulings as your actual sister. You can't marry them. Right? They like your actual, they become your mahram. It's haram for you to marry them. Right? Because you shared the same mother who breastfed you. And that mother who breastfed you becomes your mother as well, like your mother. Right? No. طيب. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was breastfed by Thuwaybah. But after that, there was a woman who was known as Halima Sa'diyah. She came with a group of women from the countryside to Mecca. And they came seeking children to take back with them. So all the women... They came across the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, and they all rejected him because he was an orphan. And because he's an orphan, they're thinking that if we take him, no one's going to pay us. We're not going to get anything in return. Right? So Halima was the last woman to take a, or pick a child. And the only option she had was the Prophet. والسلام. She says in her own account, she says that I looked at him and I disliked taking him. I didn't want to take him. Because he's an orphan. What am I going to get from his parents? He has no father who's going to pay me. And what is his mother going to do for me or his uncle or his grandfather? They're not going to give me anything. Right? So they have their own affairs to deal with. She said every single one of the other women, they had a child they took back. And I didn't find any other child to take except Muhammad So she said, I went back to him. And I took him. She said, I didn't take him because I wanted him. I only took him because I had no other choice. So then she said, I said to my husband, I swear by Allah, I'm going to take this orphan who's from Bani Abdul Muttalib. She said, hopefully one day he may benefit us so that I don't go back to the countryside, countryside empty-handed. So then her husband said to her, you have done the right thing. So she said, I took him. And she said, when I took him and we went back, my breast became filled with milk. And I was able to give him milk and also his brother, her son. Because prior to that, her son used to cry a lot at night because she never used to have enough milk to give him. She said, my breasts were now filled with milk. I was, in, I was able to give him milk and his son until they were all full. She said that... We went back and we realized that this child is Mubarak, is blessed. But that was the best night that we had. And our child slept without crying once that night because he was full. And then she says that even our cattle, our sheep, our goats, they, had, they were very skinny. And they didn't have any milk, they became filled with milk. So we had so much food and milk to go around. So then she said to her husband that this young boy, he's Mubarak, he's blessed. He has brought blessings to our lives and our homes. And she said that every day the khair was only increasing. The goodness was only increasing. So after breastfeeding the Prophet ﷺ for two years, she took the Prophet ﷺ back to his mother. And then when she took him back to his mother, she didn't take him back with the intention to leave him in Mecca, but rather with the intention to 
plead to convince his mother to let him stay with her longer. She said that Mecca is filled with illness. Let him stay with us longer so that he can be protected from this illness and we can take care of him for you. So Amina, she agreed. And Halima, she took back the Prophet ﷺ with her because she didn't want to lose his barakah that she seen that came from the Prophet ﷺ. So when she took the Prophet ﷺ back, she kept him for a longer period of time. It's said that she kept him for another two years. Now during these two years that Halima is living her best life and her family are living the best life full of barakah, they become very prosperous. All of a sudden the Prophet ﷺ is playing with his brothers from breastfeeding outside. And they're playing with the cattle. And then as they're playing, he's approached by two men who are wearing white garments. And they come to the Prophet Ali and they grab him and they put him on the ground. And they opened up his chest. Now, when they did this, the children, they ran to their mother. They said, Qutila Muhammad, Qutila Muhammad. That Muhammad Ali had been killed. Muhammad Ali had been killed. So the mother came running to come find out what happened. These two men, they were angels amongst them with Jibreel They opened up the chest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahabi Wasallam and they took out his heart. And they took out a clot out of his heart and they said, Hadha haddu shaytani mink. This is the portion of shaytan in your heart. It was taken out from the heart of the Prophet Alaihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they stitched up his heart. And they, put his, and they washed his heart in zamzam, in a golden bowl. And they put the heart of the Prophet Alaihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam back in his chest. When the children Halima came back to the Prophet Ali Salat and they saw him and his color had changed. He looked pale, like something had happened. So then Halima, she feared for the life of the Prophet Ali Salat Salam. So she decided to take him back to his mother to Mecca. Now. Assalamu alaikum brothers. As I mentioned before, the class started. It's very bad to disturb the class, and I, would like, I don't want to disturb anyone. Please, brothers, if you park to your car in the pavement right next to the masjid, please, if you can get up now and remove your car, because you block the whole pavement, no one can walk. Everyone's walking on the roads, and you're causing a problem to the masjid. So if you can get up, park your car inside the masjid, block everyone inside the masjid, rather than blocking the pavement, it's better, brothers. i got car numbers here, i got pictures here. I can read out the cars, but I'm wasting so much time. It's Sunday, everyone go work tomorrow. So please, brothers, if you know yourself, you parked your car in a pavement, go out now and remove your car. Barakallahu feekum. And I'm sorry about stopping this class. Barakallahu feekum. Tayyip. Tayyip. So then Halima, she took back the Prophet Ali Salatim to his mother. After fearing for his life, she was afraid that something is going to happen to the Prophet Ali Salatim whilst she whilst he was under her care. So when she took the Prophet Ali back to his mother, his mother, she suspected something had happened because not too long ago when they came to her, they were asking to keep the Prophet Ali and suddenly they brought the Prophet Ali back. So she thought something happened. She kept asking what happened. And Halim was refusing to tell the Prophet Ali mother. She kept refusing to tell Amina what happened. And then Amina, she kept asking what happened. You have to tell me. And then Halima eventually told Amina what happened to the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi And then Amina, the Prophet's mother Alaihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she responded by saying that Inna li ibni hada sha'na That my son, he's going to have a great future. She said, I saw before he was born that a light came out for me that lit up the palaces of a sham. So even the mother of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu she knew that his future was great, that he was not an ordinary child. Right? She said that to Halima. So they left. طيب, what are the lessons that we take from the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi being taken by Halima? What are the lessons from these incidents that we can learn? Number one, we learn the barakah of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu The Prophet Ali Sallallahu he had barakah within himself. He was mubarak. Right? And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they used to seek barakah from the Prophet Ali physically. Right? He's the only one that he is the only human being that you physically can seek barakah from. No one else. Only the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To the extent that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would make wudu, the water that would be left from his wudu, the Sahaba would fight over it. 
because it had barakah. The Prophet Ali Salat, when he would sweat, the people they would keep his sweat because it would be fragrance, misk. It smell nice. Right? So they would seek barakah from the Prophet Ali physically. And Halima, she saw that barakah of the Prophet Ali Salatu's presence. And we're going to see that many times through the seerah, the barakah of the Prophet Ali Salatu Secondly, we learn from the story of Halima Sa'diyah that what Allah wa ta'ala chooses for you is always khair. What did Halima say? That initially she said that she didn't want to take the Prophet Ali Salatu right? And she was forced to take him. It wasn't a choice. So Allah Ta'ala chose the Prophet والسلام, for her and it ended up being the best choice. Whatever Allah chooses for you is always the best. And that is what the Muslim should always have conviction regarding. That what Allah chooses for me is always khair. If I don't like it at the beginning, forget that. Did Allah choose it for you? Khalas. I'm content with it. I accept it. That is the way the Muslim is. And that's what this incident teaches us. Also, what this uh, story teaches us, it is that the Prophet والسلام, he was raised for the four, first four years of his life in the Badi in the countryside. And this had a great effect on the Prophet والسلام, in terms of the purity of his nafs, his soul, his intelligence, he was more intelligent due to that. He was more eloquent. And the ulama, they mention that that's this, a person being raised outside the city it helps him grow up upon the proper fitrah, the innate disposition. His fitrah will not be clouded. Because the city is filled with filth. And it's filled with immorality. Whereas the people who are outside the city, they tend to be very simple people. Who are upon the fitrah. Who live upon the fitrah. Right? So the Prophet والسلام, is learning that by being in the countryside. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa he learned the eloquent language of the Arabs. He was the most eloquent due to being outside the city. Because in the city, you have people mixing from all different places. The language becomes, it becomes polluted, right? And it's mixed with people who are from different ethnicities, so the language changes. Whereas, whereas in the countryside, the language is pure, right? We have that the, the Prophet, alayhi sallallahu alayhi he was asked by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Ya Rasulullah, ma ra'aytu afsaha mink. He said, O oh, oh, Messenger of Allah, I haven't seen anyone more eloquent than you because the Prophet was the most eloquent. And the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he responded by saying, Wa ma yamna'uni wa ana min Quraysh wa urdi'tu fi bani Sa'ad. He responded alayhi salatu salam, Why wouldn't I be the most eloquent when I'm from Quraysh and Quraysh were the most eloquent amongst the Arabs? And he said, and I was breastfed in Bani Sa'ad, in the Badia, in the countryside, which helped him in his eloquence. And language, ayyuh al-kiram, is essential for a leader. Being eloquent in your speech is essential for a leader. Knowing the correct language and the most eloquent language. Because a leader needs to be the one who's extremely effective in his communication. And language is the way that you communicate with others in the most effective manner. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he was the most eloquent, but he was granted something on top of that by Allah Azza wa Jal, which was known as Dawami'ul Kalim. This is something that the Prophet alayhi salatu was specified with by Allah. He was given the concise speech. He would say a few words and it would have great meaning. Right? One hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, sometimes, which is like four words, sometimes the ulama, they explain it in pages. Or a whole book is written about this one hadith as just a number of words because of the eloquence of the Prophet. Now, also, what do we learn from the opening of the chest of the Prophet? Hadith, the Shaq Sadr. The Prophet, when his chest was being opened up, what we learn from this number one, it is that Allah is preparing the Prophet for something great. For something great, which is going to happen, which is prophethood. And also preparing the Prophet ﷺ for great incidents that are going to occur in his life. That are going to be difficult. That may be difficult for his heart. Right? What we're going to see is going to come up, what's going to happen. Losing his mother. Losing his grandfather. All of these things, they have a great impact on a child. Right? And it may be difficult for a child to deal with this. Allah ﷻ prepared his heart for that. 
Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He also was preparing the Prophet alayhi salatu salam to be protected from everything that may ruin his image and his character by protecting him from shaitan so that he doesn't lead him to anything that is evil. And this is from the isma, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala protecting the Prophet alayhi salatu in prior to prophethood. The Prophet alayhi salatu never engaged in anything that was evil. He never ever prostrated to an idol. He never ever ate meat that was slaughtered for idols. He never engaged in any of the haram and the shirk that the people of Quraysh were engaging in. Never did. Rather, it was made disliked him. He disliked, he hated it. Alayhi salatu salam. Now. Tayyib. So now after hadith of shaq al-sadr, we move on to another incident. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam is six years old. His mother, she takes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam to go visit his paternal relatives that live in Yathrib. Right? who were Bani Adi ibn Najjar. She took the Prophet alayhi salatu salam to go see them in Yathrib, which is known as Medina now. So after they spent some time there, on the way back, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and his mother, they come to a place that is in between Mecca and Medina. It's right in the middle between Mecca and Medina. It's known as Al-Abwa. It's known as Al-Abwa. And the mother of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam becomes very ill. And then she ends up dying there. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ now he's burying his own mother in Al-Abwa. After his mother dies, the Prophet ﷺ is taken in by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, who is the leader of Quraysh. He loved the Prophet ﷺ more than all of his children and all of his other grandchildren. The Prophet ﷺ is more beloved to him. And he used to say, Idna li ibni hada sha'nan azima, that my son is going to have a great future. He used to say that to Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib used to have a chair, a throne that used to be outside the Kaaba. He used to sit on it. Nobody was allowed to sit on it. Even his sons wouldn't sit on it. Everyone was afraid to sit on it. But the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he would come as a child and he would sit on that throne. And then his uncles would try to get him off that chair. Tell him, move. If Abdul Muttalib sees you, you'll be in trouble. And then Abdul Muttalib will see the Prophet Sallallahu sitting there and his uncle is trying to move him and he will say, leave him. For verily, my son, he's going to have a great future. He deserves this chair, he would say. One day, Abdul Muttalib, he will send the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to go bring some stuff for him. So the Prophet Sallallahu came late. He took longer than usual. So then Abdul Muttalib, he started to do tawaf around the Kaaba. And he was extremely fearful, afraid that something had happened to the Prophet ﷺ. So then the Prophet ﷺ came back. After the Prophet ﷺ came back, he said, Ya Bunay, oh my beloved son, he said to him. He said, I became extremely sad due to you. Just like a woman when she becomes sad. That's how sad I became. I was afraid that something had happened to you. That's how much Abdul Muttalib, he, lo- he loved the Prophet ﷺ. And he took care of him until the age of eight, for two years. When the Prophet got to the age of eight, Abdul Muttalib died. And Abdul Muttalib, he advised that Abu Talib takes care of the Prophet Now Abu Talib, he's not like the other uncles of the Prophet Because Abu Talib, he is the Prophet father's full brother. Abdullah and Abu Talib, they are full brothers. They have the same mother, same father. Whereas the other uncles of the Prophet ﷺ and Abdullah, they're not full brothers. So Abu Talib had a special connection with Abdullah and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. But notice something here, ayyuh al-kiram, that the Prophet ﷺ, he continuously, after his mother passed away, he always had a father figure. And this is important as a child as a boy, that you have a male figure in your life. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was with Halim al saadiyya he had Halim al saadiyyas husband as a male figure there, as his father. He came back to his mother, he spent two years with his mother, and he has his uncles and his, his, his grandfather and so on around him. And then his grandfather takes care of him. And then his grandfather passed away, and Abu Talib takes care of him. Right? Having that male figure in your life is essential as a boy. Right? 
It's important. And the Prophet والسلام, he had that. But also, Allah Taala, he chose that the Prophet والسلام, is raised as an orphan, losing both of his parents, losing even his grandfather. So that the Prophet وسلم, by him losing both of his parents, Allah Taala wants to make sure that the Prophet والسلام, he grows up not spoilt. He grows up not having a lavish lifestyle, but rather going through hardship and difficulty. Why? So that it prepares him for the risala, the message of Allah Taala, so that he doesn't become one who's arrogant, who he doesn't become one who is يعني, uh, filled with pride, right? To do to the things that Allah has granted him. Because Allah tells us that that is the nature of man. When he's blessed by Allah Taala, he becomes arrogant and boastful. Allah says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبَتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَّمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا Allah says, man, when he's blessed by Allah and he's granted blessings, right? And he's honored by Allah. He says, my Lord has honored me. He forgets that this is a test and he becomes arrogant. And he believes that he's deserving of this blessing. And he believes that this is what I deserve. Right? This status, this wealth, whatever it may be. He becomes arrogant. Right? So sadness and grief, naturally what it does to the heart, it's that it humbles the heart. And Allah was humbling the Prophet from the beginning. Abu Talib, he takes in the Prophet Abu Talib, he was not a rich man. He was quite poor. And due to him being poor, the Prophet when he got to a certain age, he decided that I'm going to work and I'm going to help my uncle. He became a shepherd. The Prophet ﷺ became a shepherd. And he felt responsible, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that I need to help my uncle in providing for the family. I've become a man. Do you know how old the Prophet ﷺ was at this time? He was around 10 years old. Right. At the age of 10, he felt responsible that I need to provide for myself. And I need to earn. And this teaches us that earning for yourself, it is essential for the man. A man shouldn't rely on others. You should earn from your own hands, your own hard work. And the Prophet ﷺ did that from early. From the age of 10, he was working. He was earning. He was providing for himself and helping his uncle provide for his kids. Because Abu Talib had a lot of children. And he wasn't very wealthy. And all of the prophets and the messengers, they were shepherds. The Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith, مَا بَعَثَ اللَّهُ نَبِيًّا إِلَّا رَعَ الْغَنَمْ That Allah never sent a prophet except that he was a shepherd. Right? And then the Sahaba, they said, وَأَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Even you, a messenger of Allah, and he said, نَعَمْ Even I was a shepherd. I used to herd the sheep for the people of Mecca, on the outskirts of Mecca. Right, that's what he said, alayhi salatu salam. Now, طيب, what are the benefits that we learn from the Prophet, alayhi salam, being a shepherd? I want you guys to help me now. What do you learn from the, being a shepherd? What are the life lessons that you learn from it? Yes. There is no job that's beneath you. Hard work is important. The importance of hard work and earning from your hard work. Naam, okay. What else? What other life lessons do you learn from being a shepherd? Was the Prophet being taught? Yes. Responsibility. responsibility, of course. When you are a shepherd, you are responsible for the whole herd of sheep. Amongst them is the weak, amongst them the strong one, amongst them the one is the one who always strays from the flock of sheep or the herd of sheep. So you are responsible for every single one of them to make sure that they're not hurt, they're not harmed, that they're healthy, that no wolves eat them, and so on. Right? What else do you learn? Yes. You learn patience. You have to be patient with it. And two aspects, because the Prophet Ali is awesome, he's herding the sheep where? In the desert. Hot temperatures. It's difficult. He has to be patient with that. He has to be patient with these animals. Right? The animals, they don't understand speech. You have to find a way to control them. It requires patience. Right? Staying out hours for the hours for the, for the, with the sheep. Because the sheep, you go out with them from the morning, you know that. All the way to sunset. You have to be patient with when they're eating. They may take time. They may be very slow in what they're doing. You have to be patient. Forbearing. What else do you learn? Huh? 
You learn leadership, of course. Of course, you learn all of this teaches you leadership, 100%. What else? Ah. Uh, it's harder than herding camels. Yes, because it's more work. Camels, they do a lot of things for themselves. You don't need to do much. Now, what else? Hmm? Nothing else. Yes. Buying and selling. Buying and selling, maybe not so much from being a shepherd. Right, because you just heard in them, the Prophet Alice wasn't selling them. Right. Anything else? No. I sent bravery. How do you learn bravery from being a shepherd? Hmm. Exactly. You have to be prepared to fight off the other animals they may attack your sheep. It teaches you bravery, right? To be brave. You're always at risk. You could be attacked anytime. So the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam. He learned bravery from being a shepherd. All these are different lessons that you learn. From the lessons that you learn also is at tawabul humility. Because sometimes when you're herding the sheep, you have to clean them, you have to clean perhaps their feces, etc., right? That teaches you humility, that you're not above this. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that La yadkhulu jannata man kana fi qalbihi mithqalu dharrati min kibr. Whoever has an atom worth of arrogance went into Jannah. They said, Ya Rasulullah, one of us likes his garment to look good and his shoes to look good. Is that arrogance? And then he said, alayhi salatu salam, inna Allah jameel wa yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. And he said that arrogance, it is rejecting the truth and belittling the people. That's arrogance. So by herding sheep, it teaches you tawadum, humility. Right? By being around the sheep. It also teaches you mercy and compassion. Right? Because you are helping the sheep, some of them might become sick, right? They may be injured. You have to be merciful towards them. So the one who's merciful towards the animals, no doubt that he'll be extremely merciful to the creation, to human beings, even more merciful to the human beings. Now, Naam. And also, the important one is that the Prophet Ali, salatu salam, he is learning from this, the importance of earning by yourself. The Prophet Ali, salatu salam, he said, مَا أَكَلَ أَحَدٌ طَعَامًا قَطْ خَيْرًا مِنْ أَنْ يَأْكُلًا مِنْ عَمَلِ يَدِهِ That no one has ever consumed food. That is better than that which he has worked hard from himself. He's earned it from his hard work. And he said, وَإِنَّ نَبِيَّ اللَّهِ دَاوُودِ كَانَ يَأْكُلُ مِنْ عَمَلِ يَدِهِ That's the Prophet Dawood عليه السلام, he used to consume from that which he worked for. Right? And you know when you earn, you have your own earnings and you work for yourself, for instance. Right? What does it teach you? It teaches something else, that it teaches one to be outspoken when it comes to the truth. What do I mean by that? When you don't rely on others to give you wealth, you want fear uttering the truth. How many people have we found because so-and-so gives them their salary, they can't speak the truth. They can't utter the truth. Allah is teaching the Prophet that earn from your hard work. Don't rely on others so that nobody can ever bribe you or try to convince you to compromise your values and your principles. Right? Now. طيب. Okay. We're going to take a break. I want everyone to stand up. Bismillah. Boom. Bismillah. طيب. The person on your right... Give him salam. Ask him his name. <laughs> now the one on your left. Turn to him, ask him his name. Jameel. Wow, what a, what's long names you have? Take a seat. طيب. الحمد لله. Now do we have enough energy for another five hours? <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. طيب. 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 
طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. اوكي. Okay. We only have a little bit left and then we'll conclude inshallah. Okay. So just a bit more patience. Inshallah. طيب. Now we move on to the next stage. Which is that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He protected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even prior to prophethood, right? Now, how did Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala protect the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam? We mentioned it early on, but we will repeat some of them. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala protected the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam from shirk. He never engaged in shirk. He never ever worshipped the idols. Rather, we have in the Muslim of, of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimahu Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, he says, that is reported from Hisham ibn Urwa, that he reports from his father. He said, حدثني جار لخديجة The neighbor of خديجة رضي الله عنها informed me أنه سمع النبي that he heard this prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say He said to خديجة أي خديجة أو خديجة والله لا أعبد اللات والله لا أعبد العزة أبدا He said I swear by Allah I will not worship اللات I swear by Allah I will not worship العزة These are the names of the idols of Quraysh he never had worshipped them, never will worship them, ever. وَكَانَ لَا يَكُلُ مَا ذُبِّحَ عَلَى النُّصُبِ And the Prophet ﷺ never used to eat anything that was sacrificed for the idols. And also Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He protected the Prophet ﷺ when he was a young man, when he was in his youth. He protected him from doing anything immoral. Anything immoral. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, ما هممت بقبيح I never ever intended to do something that was bad or considered immoral right or that may harm his character he said مما كان أهل الجاهلية يهمون به from the matters that the people of Jahili used to desire and do he said إلا مرتين من الدهر except two times in his whole life the Prophet ﷺ desired it right but he said both of these times Allah protected me from them he never did it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said that He was herding sheep Just outside Mecca And then he saw a young man He said to this young man Look after the sheep for me Tonight I want to Go enjoy some of the things That the young men of Mecca They do at night Right Whether it is parting They call it a summer in Arabic Right So the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam He said I wanted to do that So he told this young man To look after the sheep so this young man, he said he agreed. So the Prophet ﷺ left. He went and he left. And as he got closer to Mecca, he heard some music. Right? He heard some music. And some drums being hit. And some flutes that were being blown. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ma hadha? They said, so and so is getting married. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he got distracted by the sound. And then... As he heard that sound and he was listening to it, he was overcome by sleep and he fell asleep. He never went. And he slept until the sun had risen. He was woken up by the sun, the heat of the sun. So the next day he went back to the man that he left his sheep with and he asked him, what happened? What did you do? He said, I went, but I fell asleep, so nothing happened really. So he said, look after the sheep for me today again. I'll try again tomorrow. So the Prophet ﷺ went back. The next day, and when he got closer, the same thing happened and he fell asleep. And he never went. And then he came back to the man the next day and he asked him what happened. And he said the same thing happened, I didn't do anything. Right? And that's the last time he وسلم, desired any of that. What does that teach us? That the Prophet وسلم, Allah created him just like any other young man. He desired the things that other young men desire. But Allah protected him from doing anything immoral. Or being in environments that immorality has been done in. Allah protected the Prophet ﷺ from that even prior to prophethood. So that nothing can harm his message. Nobody can say, you are the one who used to do this back in the days. You are the one who used to engage in this and that. La, there was not a single bad thing that Quraysh could list that the Prophet ﷺ had done. Because Allah protected him from that. Isma. He was infallible in that sense. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa wasallam. No. طيب. When the Prophet Ali والسلام, he was around the age of 12, he went on a journey with his uncle. 
to Asham on a business trip. They went on a business trip to, trip to Syria. Now when they got to Syria, something interesting happened. And the Prophet وسلم, when they approached a city known as Busra, which is in Syria, not Basra in Iraq, Busra. It's a city in Syria. When they approached that city, there was a Christian monk that lived there, a priest. He lived in Busra. And Quraysh used to always come there and he never ever used to speak to them. He never used to engage with them. He used to stay in his house. Everyone knew where he lived. He never used to come out to them. But this time, the priest, when he saw Quraysh approaching, he came out of his house. So they found that strange. And then he started to look around amongst them, right, going through the different ranks of Quraysh to see who's with them. And then he saw the Prophet Sallallahu And then he shouted, هذا سيد العالمين هذا رسول رب العالمين بعثه الله رحمة العالمين He said that this is the chief of the worlds. This is the messenger of the Lord of the universe. Allah has sent him as a mercy to mankind, to the universe. So then Quraysh, the men of Quraysh, the leaders, they said, ما, ما علمك? ما علمك? What informed me? How do you know? Where did you get this information from? He said, when you guys came close, there was no tree and no rock except that it prostrated to the Prophet يسجدون إلا للنبي and they do not prostrate except to a prophet. And he said, And I know him because the seal of the Prophet the Prophet he had a mark which looked like an apple just under his shoulder blade. Right? The seal of prophethood. So then he went back into his house and he made them food. He invited them in. First time it's ever happening. He never invited them in. And then he said to them, where are you going? Are you going towards Syria? They said, yes. He said, I beg you, don't go. Don't take him there. He said, don't take him to the Romans because if the Romans find out about him, they are going to kill him. Now this incident is it's very interesting. That Buhaira, who is the name, what is the name of the monk? His name is Buhaira al-Rahib. Buhaira, he, and his actual name was Jarjis. His actual name was Jarjis. Buhaira, he knew about the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. And this teaches that the people of the previous scriptures, they knew exactly the Prophet ﷺ is coming. And they knew the truth. But they rejected it due to their arrogance. Why was Buhaira afraid of the Prophet ﷺ going to the Romans? Because the Romans, they knew that there was a Prophet coming and that Prophet is going to be the one who destroys their empire. So if they could get hold of him, they'll kill him. That's what Buhaira was afraid of. He told the Prophet the Abu Talib to take him back to Mecca. In another narration it says that Buhaira said, don't let the Jews find him. Why did he specify the Jews? Because the Jews, they were hoping that the Prophet is coming from them. right? If they were to find out that the Prophet is from the Arabs, they would kill him. right? It also teaches us that this incident that the Prophet ﷺ, he was given signs even prior to prophethood. That the trees and the rocks were prostrating to him. That the trees were providing shade for him and following him to provide shade for him. These were signs that the Prophet ﷺ was granted even prior to prophethood to show that something great is coming. Right? And a lot of Quraysh saw that. Right? And a lot of those men amongst Quraysh who saw that still disbelieved when the, when the Prophet ﷺ brought the message to them. They saw all of that and they still disbelieved. Now, so their disbelief, it shows that it wasn't a matter of them rejecting the truth because they didn't have enough evidence. It was due to other matters. Their arrogance um, and their pride and also because of their attachment to certain worldly matters, etc. Now, after that, the Prophet ﷺ came back to Mecca. And when he came back to Mecca, an incident occurred in Mecca which was known as Harb al-Fujjar. It was a war that happened in Mecca between the people of Mecca and the people of Ta'if. This was known as Harb al-Fujjar. It was known as the wretched war, the evil war. The reason why it was called that, it is because it is said that it happened in the sacred months and the Ashur al-Hurum fighting is haram in those months. The Arabs prior to even Islam, they used to glorify these months. What are the sacred months? 
How many are they? Four. What are they? Which months are they? Huh? Dhul Hijjah. Muharram. Not Ramadan. Not Sha'ban. Rajab. Naam. And Dhul Qa'dah. So we have Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, these three in a row. And Rajab by itself. These are the four sacred months. Right? These sacred months, the Arabs, they would glorify these months. They wouldn't fight. But also the reason why it's called Halb al-Fuhar al-Fujjar is because Mac Mecca is sacred. No fighting was allowed in Mecca. And this fighting occurred in Mecca, which is another form of fujur, of evil. What caused this war? It was one of the leaders of Ta'if, of the tribe of Hawazin. He sent one of his men with a caravan to Suq Ukav. Okay, Suq Ukav was a, was a market in Mecca that the Arabs used to gather in. We're very famous. He sent him with a caravan to Suq Ukav. And previously, he used to have a man who was known as Al Al Barrad ibn Qais ibn Kinana, who's from Quraysh, right? From the allies of Quraysh. And he used to be the man who used to have that caravan for the king and he used to take care of and so on. But this time he was replaced. So the man who replaced him, he came and ridiculed him and mocked him and made him seem like he is nothing and belittled him and lowered him that you have been degraded, khalas. You lost everything that you have. I've taken your post and so on. So this led to a personal feud between the two. The other one, al burrad he got angry. And what did he end up doing? He ended up killing, okay, Urwa, who was the man who was leaving the caravan. He killed him. He caught him off guard and killed him. So what did it lead to? It led to a tribal war between the tribes of Hawazin, which are in Ta'if, and all of Kinana, which Quraysh is one of. They all came together to fight Hawazin, which is from Abna Ab 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 Qais, right? And Kinana, they fought. The Prophet والسلام, when this war was happening, he was 15 years old. He, sallallahu alayhi wa he didn't participate in the warfare, but he, sallallahu alayhi wa he prepared the arrows for his uncles. The arrows that they used for the bows, he prepared them and gave it to his uncles, right? Showing us that the Prophet alayhi salat, he was taught to warfare from a young age. And courage in battle, on the battlefield from a young age, from his uncles, sallallahu alayhi wa He had that training from a young age. After this incident happened, Harb al-Fujjar, when he ended, another important incident happened where the Prophet ﷺ took part in, which is Hilf al-Fudul. Hilf al-Fudul, it happened after Harb al-Fujjar where a man came to Mecca from the tribe of Bani Zabid, which are from Yemen. This man, he's a stranger to Mecca. He's not from the people of Mecca, he's from Yemen. So this man, he came to Mecca and he was selling some goods in Mecca. So one of the leaders of Quraysh, his name was Al-As ibn Wa'il. Al-As ibn Wa'il, he came to this man from Zabid and he bought the goods from him. But then he refused to give him his money. He refused to give him his money. So this man from Zabid, he started shouting to all the leaders of Quraysh. Ya Ahla Quraysh, are you going to let this man oppress me? Ya Ahla Quraysh, are you going to help me? And the leaders of Quraysh refused to help. Because Al-As ibn Wa'in is from the honorable men of Quraysh, the leaders of Quraysh. They didn't want to turn on him. So they allowed him to oppress this man. But there were other men who heard this call and this cry out from this man. So they came together. Banu Hashim, the clan of Bani, ha Bani Hashim came together, which is the clan of the Prophet ﷺ. Also Az Zuhra came together. Okay, Banu Tayn came together. They all came together in the house of a man known as Abdullah ibn Jid'an. And they made an agreement. They made a treaty. This treaty was known as Hilf al Fudul, the virtuous treaty. And they made an agreement that they will not be anyone who's oppressed except that we are going to help them and support them against their oppressor. Right? They all agreed upon that and they signed it. Every single man who was there signed it. The Prophet ﷺ was present and he also signed it. And then what they did was they first, the first step that they took was they went to al As ibn Wa'il and they got him to give the money that the Zubaydi man deserved. And they gave it to Zubaydi man. The Prophet ﷺ, he said about Hilf al-Fudul that 
لقد شهدت في داري عبد الله بن جدعان that I witnessed in the house of عبد الله بن جدعان حلفا a treaty ما أحب أن لي به حمر النعم that I do not prefer to be given the red she camel instead of witnessing it what does that mean and the most valuable thing about time was the red she camel right the prophet ali said if i was given the most valuable thing the most expensive thing at this time i would not prefer it over witnessing that treaty right and he said walaw du'itu bihi fi al-islam la ajabtu he said if, if i was called that treaty in islam i would also attend what does this teach us it teaches that one of the great objectives of Islam is al-adl justice. That Islam is against all forms of oppression. It also teaches us that coming together and making a treaty with your fellow Muslims to get rid of all forms or all different types of oppression, right? it is from the greatest, noblest acts that one can engage in. Because Allah Taala says, "وَتَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ." Aid and assist each other upon God consciousness, right, and righteousness, and do not aid and assist each other upon al-ithm, evil and sins, and udwan and enmity. Right. So Islam teaches us that. So it allowed for the Muslim to unite with other Muslims to make an agreement, and they all sign it that they are going to do something that benefits Islam, something that serves Islam, that's allowed, right? With a condition that they don't do it like Masjid Dirar. You know Masjid Dirar? Have you heard of Masjid Dirar? The hypocrites in Medina, they established the Masjid in Medina called Masjid Dirar, right? They established it to disunite the Muslims and to, to have a Masjid which is in opposition to the Prophet's Masjid, alayhi salatu salam. The hypocrites did that. So if you are coming together with other Muslims to cause hizbiyah, right, partisanship, right, and to disunite the Muslims, then that's not allowed. But if it's for a cause that serves the Muslims present in the present and in the future, which is noble that Islam permits, that's allowed to unite the Muslims to do that. Rather, it is praiseworthy and recommended. And that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. And he instructed us to do. He said, if I was to be called to the same thing in Islam, I would attempt and I will sign the treaty because it's praiseworthy. It also teaches us that Islam supports the oppressed regardless of his religion, his ethnicity, where he's from, his background, and so on. Islam doesn't look at what this oppressed person is. If he's oppressed, it's obligatory upon you to help the one who's oppressed. It's obligatory upon you as a Muslim. Right? And if he's a Muslim... He has, you have a greater responsibility to help him because he has that right upon you. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Unsur akha That you have to grant victory to your brother, ظَالِمًا as an oppressor or madhruma. The Prophet ﷺ was asked by the companions, Ya Rasulullah, we understand helping the oppressed one, but how do we help the oppressor? He said, by stopping him from oppression. You have to stop the oppressor from oppressing. That's the responsibility of the Muslim. Now, also we learn from this that the, that the Muslim, he needs to be a positive influence in his community. The Prophet ﷺ didn't just love, live in Mecca without engaging in things that made a difference. The Prophet ﷺ made a difference. And this is important for the da'iyah, the one who's calling to Allah wa ta'ala. You need to have a past that supports your da'wah. You can't just all of a sudden come out to now, nowhere and say, I'm going to give da'wah when nobody knows anything about you. You need to have seerah hasana, a good past, which helps your da'wah so that people are more accepting of your da'wah. Right? You have to be one who's active in this community prior to the da'wah. You have to be trying to engage in that which you have the ability to do so to help the Muslims. If you're one who aspires to serve the Muslims in da'wah or whatever it may be, anything else. So the Prophet ﷺ wasn't just a number in society, wasn't just a member of his society. He was someone who was well known in society for his character, his positive influence. He was known for being involved in the goodness and not being involved in any of the evil. Siratul Hasana. Right? Now, Tayyib Jameel, up to here, inshaAllah ta'ala, we shall stop. And 
next week, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to start from when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gets married. And I know everyone likes to hear about marriage. Right? And you love hearing about marriage, right? So it's something to look forward to next week. Right? Inshallah ta'ala, he's married to Khadija and so on. Bi'idhnillah ta'ala, we'll cover it all next week. Bi'idhnillah ta'ala, ta'ala. Are there any questions? Yes. Sorry? The lineage of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, do we have it all the way to Prophet Adam alayhi salam? They are some of the historians who mention the lineage of the Prophet alayhi salam, all the way to Adam alayhi salam. But what did we say? The only lineage that we have that's authentic of the Prophet alayhi salatu is up to where? Adnan. Everything after Adnan, between Adnan and Ismail is disputed. And then after Ibrahim alayhi salam, it's all disputed. Yeah. We don't, we don't know. We have no authentic narration after that. No. Now, how old is the Prophet Alaihissalam when he signed the treaty? The Prophet Alaihissalam when he signed the treaty, he was sixteen years old. Right. Any other questions? The Prophet Alaihissalam shows you the Prophet Sallallahu He had a great role in his community and society from a very young age. Right? There was no such thing as you are young. La. The Prophet Ali felt responsible from a young age. No. Ah, uh -huh, yes. He was 15 years old. Harbul Fujar. No. Any other questions? Yes. How old is How old? How old? MashaAllah. Sorry? When he didn't attend any party. The Prophet was 13 years old at the time. He's a young man. 13. 1 3. Any other questions? Yes. We haven't got there yet. That's when the Prophet was 35 years old. That's when they rebuilt the Kaaba. We're going to get there, inshallah. Next week. Inshallah. Any other questions? Mm, no. Sorry? Ah. Now, the man that caused it, his name was Al Burrad. Right? He was from Bani Kinana. And the man he killed was known as Urwa. Ibn al-Rahal. No. Any other questions? If there's no questions, then I have questions. Oh, you have one more question? Yeah, just one. Before I ask my questions. <laughs> just, uh, I'm just questioning in regards to the time that the battle happened in Mecca. Hmm. Um, I heard that in regards to the culture of the Arabs at the time was they, they had a sacred month. They would push it back a month. Yeah, they would, do, they would try to do that, yeah. So the Arabs, they would try to play around with the sacred months. Right? Especially the month of Rajab. So they knew that Rajab is a sacred month. They can't fight in it. All they do, they will try to change the month. They'll say it's not this month now. It's, 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 uh, they'll say Sha'ban instead of Rajab. Right? So that they can permit themselves to fight. They'll try to deceive the system. And then it wouldn't work, of course. Now. Uh, why were those months uh, sacred? Ah, good question. Why are these months sacred? Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَ عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمْ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ the Allah said, Verily the months in the sight of Allah are 12, when Allah created the heavens and the earth. And from these 12 months, they are four that Allah has chosen as sacred months. Allah chose them. Right? Then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He advised us and He instructed us, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not oppress yourselves in these sacred months. What does it mean that, you know, the ulama, they say, commenting on this ayah, that the sins that you commit in these months, they are severer than any other time. And also the good deeds you do in these months, they are multiplied more than any other time, right? So that is what it means that these sacred months, Allah chose them. And it's not only specific to Islam. It was known prior to Islam in the previous religions as well. And the previous people, they knew it. And that's how Quraysh, they knew it. Because Quraysh, prior to becoming Mushrikeen, they were upon the religion of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. And then they 
deviated. Who was the man who introduced idol worship to Mecca? Does anyone know his name? Sorry? The man, yes. Ahsant. His name is Amr ibn Luhay. Amr ibn Luhay, he went and he went to Sham and he saw that people were worshipping idols. He liked the idea, so he brought it back to Mecca and he introduced idol worship to Mecca. Before that, they were upon the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, they're monotheists. So, Amr ibn Luhay, he carries all the sin of those who did shirk after him. No. No questions? I have questions. Atfadl. You guys are saving them from questions, huh? There were angels. It was Jibreel alayhi salam. I mentioned that it was Jibreel alayhi salam. Another angel that was with him that came wearing white garments. Now, yes. Mm. I did the Prophet Ali sort of question it? He didn't exactly question it, and he didn't say anything Ali, that was out of the ordinary. Right? We don't have any narration the Prophet Ali said anything out of the ordinary. However, the Prophet Ali did notice these things. He knew about them. He couldn't quite understand what they were, but he knew what was happening. Right? And these things, they happened throughout his life, but Allah wa ta'ala had inspired the Prophet Ali to kind of understand these matters. Until when he finally received revelation where he completely thought he was losing his mind. Because all these things, they seem like minor incidents. Right? And he let them go, one by one. He let them go. Until the ultimate matter happened where Jibreel alayhi salam came to him, and that's when he thought, I've lost my mind. Right? And that's what he said to Khadija. We're going to get there next week, inshallah. Now. Yes. Allahumma <laughs> Mm. Mm. Jamil, the Prophet ﷺ didn't know at the time when he was a child, he didn't know that about these signs. He was told about these signs later on when he received revelation. Right? And we have in the famous hadith of Salman al Farisi radiallahu anhu when Salman came to Medina looking for Islam. One of the things that he read in the previous scriptures and he was taught that, that the Prophet ﷺ has a seal of prophethood. So that is one of the things that he was looking out for before he embraced Islam. So we find the narration the Prophet ﷺ was in Salah, Salman al Farisi came. And he was not praying, but he's trying to look at the Prophet ﷺ when he's in sujood to see the seal of Prophet. So the, Allah Taala sent Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet ﷺ to inform him that Salman is trying to look. So the Prophet ﷺ uncovered it for him while he was in sujood so he could see it. And then after Salah, Salman came and embraced Islam, right? Amongst other signs as well. But he was informed of these signs after he received revelation. He didn't know it prior to that, even though they were in the previous scriptures. The Prophet ﷺ didn't know about any of that stuff. He hadn't read any of the previous scriptures. He hadn't heard of them. He hadn't been exposed to them, and so on. He'd heard things from. Buhaira, as we mentioned, Buhaira mentioned this is so on a few things, but anything except that he has he didn't know. No, oh, yeah. Any other question? Please. Ah, uh, you're saving everyone, Sheikh. <laughs> We're never getting to my questions. Just a small point. Uh, just where was his, yani, it was just under. It was just under his shoulder blade. Just under his shoulder blade. No. Please, Jamil. Um, throughout the, the lesson, we mentioned a number of benefits from different incidents that occur. Oh, you have a question, Abdullah? I don't know. I didn't see it. <laughs> I'll find out. Maybe next week I'll find out. I'll, I'll, I'll do some research. If he was on the right or the left. But we mentioned in the, in the lesson a number of benefits regarding right, the nasab of the Prophet the lineage. Right? What was the... The, the benefit of the Prophet ﷺ being from the most honorable lineage. What do we mention? Who can remind me? Huh? People are more likely to take him as a leader when he comes from an honorable lineage. Correct. The Prophet ﷺ, the day he was born, which day is it? Rabi' al-Awwal? We don't know why. Because there was no significant act that was done on that day, the 12th Rabi' al-Awwal or whatever other day it is. Rather, you know, the 12th Rabi' al-Awwal is the day the Prophet ﷺ died. It's the day the Prophet ﷺ died. طيب. We also mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ, he said to the Sahaba that he was three things, right? 
Something to do with Ibrahim, Isa, and his mother. What were these matters that he mentioned? Huh? Yes. The dua of Ibrahim. The glad tidings of Isa. And light came out of his mother before he was born. She saw a dream that light came out of her that lit up the palace in Sham. What does that indicate? What does it symbolize? Huh? I didn't mention this earlier on, so this is a benefit you guys can get out of it. Figure it out yourselves. Huh? What does it symbolize? That the palace of Sham are lit up with light. Mm, a big future ahead. Anything else? Sorry? Yes. Naam. That's the guidance of the Prophet is going to reach as far as that. And it's also going to lead to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Naam. Tayyip. We also mentioned that Halima Sa'diyah, she took the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, she breastfed him. What were the benefits that we learned from Halima Sa'diyah taking the Prophet alayhi salatu salam? Yes. 